All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is McKenna Sturgeon. I am the Training and Marketing Specialist for the Colorado Municipal League. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. Um, it's the third installment of our election series as we prepare for April 2022 elections. Our webinar today focuses on signature verification, ballot format, and canceling an election. So just ahead of you know hopping into this webinar, we did want to give you guys a heads up if you're new to uh, go to webinar or just you know our webinars in general. Um, Today's webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on our website along with the PowerPoint slides for reference. So we ask for about 24 hours to get those posted and then I will send a recap email with the link with all of that information for you once it's available. Um, additionally, attendees of today's webinar can also apply for one half credit with CMCA. That's the Colorado Municipal Clerks Association. To apply for that credit, you'll need to complete and submit an assessment form. I'll explain how to do that later in this webinar, as well as send that form along with all of the other information that I do in my recap email. Um, so for those of you new to go to webinar, you should see a control panel on the right of your screen. This is where you're going to be able to ask questions. Please feel free to leave questions throughout the webinar. I will be interrupting as Karen speaks um, so that we can get those all answered. And any questions that don't get answered, we'll also download and make sure that we get to you um, later and we'll follow up on those. Um, so with all of that, I'll introduce Karen really quick, not that she needs any introduction. Um, Karen Goldman, MMC, currently runs the Municipal Clerk Advisor Program, which was created by CML, CIRSA, and CMCA as a free service to assist municipal clerks with specific job-related questions. Karen has 20 plus years of experience as both a municipal clerk and municipal clerk trainer. So CML is greatly appreciative, and thank you, Karen, for doing everything that you do. I will now turn it over to you and go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we just see your face while you speak. All right. Thank you, McKenna, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm hoping that all of you are in the throes of verifying signatures on nomination petitions. I always figure that if you're going to have an election, you might as well have an election. And so I'm hoping that you're getting a lot of interest uh, in from folks who are interested in serving uh, on the town boards and serving the citizens of their community. So the bulk of the uh, webinar today is going to be concentrating on ballot formatting and how to cancel the election and then what to do after you cancel the election. But what I wanted to do is go ahead and recap what we talked about in our last session regarding signature verification. So with that, I'm going to ask McKenna to give us the first slide. So what we're talking about is we're talking about verifying signatures on the nomination petitions and what that means signature verification is sort of a generic term these days but what it means for purposes of the nomination petitions is that what you are doing is you are comparing the names and the addresses against those on the voter registration list you are using but what you are not doing is comparing the way people actually sign their names um, which is only eligible when you have a mail ballot election and you're verifying the signature on the back of the return envelope. So again, you are comparing names and addresses and addresses must match. Now I put, I don't put a lot of state statute in this presentation because I figure you're gonna, you've read it all and that kind of thing. But I always do this one to make sure that everybody understands why and how the, the addresses must much match. Um, excuse me, must match on any document where it is requiring the signature of a registered elector. And so this particular citation is actually the definition of registered elector. And it does say that whenever a registered elector is required to sign any document, a person is considered properly registered if the name and address on the document matches the name and address 
on the voter registration list. And what we're really concentrating on here, are focusing on here, are the addresses. Because when a person signs his or her name using a shortened name or a nickname, that will not disqualify the signature from being considered if you can easily determine that Ned really is Edward or that Peggy is really Margaret, that kind of thing. So we don't disqualify. We always err on the side of the voter. Now, when you are disqualifying the signatures, I strongly suggest that you identify the reason for disqualification. You can, you can uh, create codes. Um, if you can't read it, it's illegible, you can use the code IL. If they're not registered, you can use NR for, for not registered. If the addresses don't match, you can use WA for wrong address. There aren't a lot of reasons for disqualifying signatures, but it's always a good idea to let people know why you've disqualified a particular signature, because if the petition needs to be cured, they need to know why or they should know why, or it's a good idea to let them know why, okay? So if a nomination, I said this the last time, if the nomination petition needs to be cured by adding more signatures, then what you do is you provide them with a brand new blank petition where they can go out and get more signatures. And the reason for that is that when they sign the acceptance of nomination, they are signing that they accept the nomination of the persons who sign their petition and the acceptance is written, is completed after all the signatures have been signed. So obviously you can't add anything, you have to start anew. But if the nomination petition needs to be cured or fixed by doing something with the affidavit of circulator, perhaps they forgot the date or they forgot the stamp or something like that, or the acceptance of nomination doesn't include the name how they wanted to appear on the ballot, and I've seen that, then you just return that petition to them and they can fix it and then return it. Now, what I always like to do after you verify the signatures, if you have um, if the petition is sufficient and you have an email address or you have a way of contacting them in writing, I would send them an email and let them know, you know, that you've been, you checked the signatures and you've determined that the petition is valid and they are eligible to run for office. If you, if you have to call them, then what I do is I put a notation somewhere on the petition that says petition determined to be sufficient or sufficient petition, and then you date stamp it. So basically you have a record because if somebody comes back and they want a challenge, at least you can show that number one, it was valid, and number two, you did certify it as valid, and number three, you have the date when you did that. So that's all I'm gonna say right now about signature verification. Are there any questions about this before we move on? It doesn't look like we have questions right now. Okay, well, if you think of something in the future, just type them in um, and we'll go from there. So McKenna, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the format of your ballot. And we're gonna talk about it in terms of the order of items. And it's, in, it's my opinion, this is not, some of this stuff is actually in statute, like how you arrange the names on the ballot. Some of it is not in statute, but we're, we're, and we're looking at it from the perspective of best practice. So I think it's always a good idea to do your candidates first. And for some of you, that's all you're going to have on the ballot. I know there's some municipalities out there um, that have got ballot items on the ballot as well, Tabor and non-Tabor alike. So you list your candidates first. And I always like to list the mayor mayoral candidates before the board of trustee candidates. Um, the mayor's position is just a little bit elevated. He or she is the person that runs the meetings and is the ceremonial head you know, of your municipality. So I think it's always good to have the mayoral candidates first. And then it, it's followed by all the board of trustee candidates. And by statute, the names of all the candidates 
are arranged by lot. Now, lot can be a number of things. Uh, you could put everybody's name in a hat, invite them to the drawing, pull the names out of the hat one at a time. That's how it works. You can put numbers in a hat, and all the people there, the candidates there, can pick a number. That would be the order. Um, you can draw straws, although I don't know anybody draws straws anymore. Um, you, but there's a number of ways to do it, but it's it's a, it's random, and all the ballots will contain the same order. So it's it it used to be alphabetical. That was a long time ago, and now it's arranged by lot. So once you have all the candidates identified, then you want to go ahead and you want to put your ballot items. Now this is actually in both the Constitution and um, it, actually it's in the Constitution. When it, if you have a Tabor issue, if you have a Tabor issue, it goes before all non-Tabor issues. And if you have a Tabor issue that was placed on the ballot through a citizen initiative, and you have a Tabor issue that was placed on the ballot by referral by your governing body, the citizen initiated Tabor item goes first and then the referred measure. And then those are followed by non-Tabor. And again, there is no, there isn't anything in, in non-Tabor, which is everything that else that's not financially based that talks about citizen goes first and then referred measure. So what I like to do is that I always like to put it on the ballot in the order that it was set for the ballot. So in other words, if there were um, three items placed on the ballot by your governing body, the first one they did goes first, the second one they did goes next and so forth. If there were citizen initiated items, then whatever date you approved it for the election, that would be the date. Now, if you can't exactly figure it out, no harm, no foul. It really, but it's it's just a matter. And then once you establish a procedure, remember consistency for the future is the best way to do it. And I think that you want to establish a procedure because you know if you've got some citizen initiated things, you've got some things on the ballot that are pretty controversial, People might assume that you put the ones you want to pass first because there have been studies that talk about ballot drop off or people are less inclined to vote. And I just think it's a good idea to be able to justify how you put them on the ballot and why. Next slide, please. We have a quick question oh. before we move on. Okay. So if only one person runs for mayor, do you still put their name on the ballot along with the trustee choices? Absolutely. And we'll get to that. We'll get to, uh, and that goes uh, hand in hand with the idea of canceling the election. So we'll talk in more detail about that later on today, but the answer is absolutely yes. Okay. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay. So. Here we go again for the ballot form format. If you are if you are counting your ballots by hand, then what you'll do is you'll put the name of the person and then it's followed by a blank line. And I think statute says mark an X, but if somebody puts a check mark, that's the same thing as an X. Usually when you've hired a firm to um, and you're renting equipment to count the ballots so they're being counted by machine generally what happens is there's like a circle or an oval that follows a person's name and the instructions are to fill that in so i just want to let you know that those are the the two types of voting um for means that you'll see on ballots and then what you want to do is you want to identify the maximum number of candidates a person may vote on. And remember, people can vote on as up to as many candidates as there are positions to be filled. So for mayor, it would be one. So you would say vote for not more than one or vote for no more than one. In a, I'm going to call it a normal election, where you don't have any shortened terms on the ballot, and then again, we're going to talk about what that what that means later on. When you only have 
the full year terms usually for the board of trustees for people who have six trustees there'll be three so it would say vote for not more than three or vote for no more than three and um but where there are shortened terms also that are to be voted on whatever the number of positions it could be four it could be five i hope it's not six but it it could be in some situations but whatever the number is you want to identify the maximum number that people can vote for they don't have to vote for that total so if you vote can vote for three and they only vote for two or they only vote for one that's still okay you just count whatever vote is marked um, if they count if they vote for more than what they're permitted then you count none of the votes because they can only vote for three they put down five which three are you going to pick you're not because it's not your job and then I believe that the length of the term of office is not necessary to be placed on the ballot. And when you've got both shortened terms and full terms on the ballot to be voted on at the same time, it is absolutely impossible to list the terms of office. Remember, if you have full terms and shortened terms, People, when they run for office, they do not circulate a nomination petition with the idea that they're only going to run for the two-year term or they, only, they don't want to be considered for the shortened term. They only want to run for the full term. That doesn't happen because that's not the way whoever gets the full term and the shortened term. That's not how it's determined. And again, you'll see that later on. Questions here? Um, I don't think so. All right, let's keep going then. All right, so for the ballot items, the ballot items have are sh listed as shall. Shall such and such and such be approved. And then you have a yes. You either have a line if you're hand counting it or if you're machine counting it, it'll be a circle and then you'll have below it a no with the same thing, either a line now, again, people don't have to vote on these ballot items, and they. but here it's a choice. If they vote both yes and no, it does not count. Now, sometimes what you're going to see is that somebody maybe marks like a, a yes, and then they write a note, I didn't mean to do this. Well, you can divine voter intent by that note. So in this particular case, if they yes, and then they go, I didn't mean to do that, and they also mark no, then when the ballot is counted, it's a no. A machine will, I, will probably throw that out and not be able to count it because it's not programmed that way and will need human eyes among, from the judges to determine what the intent is. So if it's a Tabor item, it has to be printed in all capital letters. But if it's not a Tabor item, then you just use what I call normal typeface. The first word and all proper nouns are capitalized and everything else is in lowercase. And I can remember every time when I worked for the city of Aurora, where the attorneys, um, you know, where the, the governing body, the city council put something on the ballot, I don't care if it was Tabor or not Tabor, the way it showed up in the resolution was in all caps. And it was up to me to know the difference and not put all caps for something that doesn't need it. All caps is really jarring to read, as I'm sure you've noticed when you've had to vote on a Tabor issue yourself. Then in terms of the numbering system, you can do a number of things. You can follow the Secretary of State's rules, which are a combination of numbers and letters, I believe, um, I know that A is the letters are for items that are put on the ballot by the governing body and the numbers are put on the ballot um, by citizens and you, you'll, you'll actually see that when you take a look at statewide ballot items you can do that or you can just use sequential numbering first item is one second item is two so forth and so on whatever you decide to do again I I think it's a good idea to be consistent from election to election 
And um, I will tell you that the county clerks, when you put an item on a coordinated ballot, will follow the Secretary of State rules. So. We do have a couple of questions really quick. Sure. All right, so this is someone who is running their first election um, and they have five trustee seats up, three or four year terms and two are two year terms. Mm -hmm. Are they correct in assuming that residents can vote for five candidates? Yes. Awesome. I think that should do it on those questions. Okay, all right. So I believe, as I recall, this is the last on ballot format again. If somebody thinks something later on, we can come back to it. And I think we're going to move on. Yes, we are. All right. Canceling an election. Um, okay, so we'll go through this. All right. Canceling election is not automatic. It requires that the governing body at some point along the way, and they only have to do this once, has adopted an ordinance that really deals with write-in candidates. And also as a secondary item, talks about canceling the election. So if you are, and I think I'm pretty sure, but not totally sure that the majority of municipalities have such an ordinance in place because I know for myself, I've been talking about it for a very, very long time. So the idea of, so, so it has to, so, so, so again, it's an ordinance that talks about how a person becomes a write-in candidate and is eligible to have his or her name written in on the ballot. And then it also talks about, again, canceling the election, and they are related, as you will see. So first of all, in order to cancel an election, the only time you can cancel an election is when the only item you have on the ballot is the election of officers. So any of you who have items on the ballot in addition to your candidates in April, you're going to go ahead and have an election. Sorry, or maybe yay, depending on how you look at running elections. So the only matter is the election of officers. And here's what the ordinance says. The ordinance says, and you can take this language directly from state statute. It says that if at the close of business on the 64th day before the election, there are not more candidates than offices to be filled. Now remember, your petitions are due on the on the 71st day. And one thing I forgot to mention is check the signatures as soon you can after the petitions are turned in. Do not wait for the 71st day to start checking your signatures. I know you don't need a lot, but there's no reason to wait. Okay? So that's so the 71st day is when the nomination petitions are due they can amend the petition if they have to i think it's no later than the 64th day before the day of the election if you want to be a write-in candidate you have to write issue a notice of intent i think that's somewhere on one of the future slides you have to write a notice of intent saying i intend to be a write-in candidate no form is required. Some municipalities may have created a form, but a notarized letter is fine. Email isn't enough, but a notarized letter is fine. So that has to be filed. So by the 64th day, when you've got amended petitions in, you know if you have any write-in candidates. If there are not more candidates, including write-in candidates, and the only thing you have on your ballot for consideration is the election of officers, your governing body can cancel the election. They do it by adopting a resolution and they declare that the people whose names appear on the ballot are duly elected. 
Now I'm going to pause here for the moment just to make sure that everybody understands that's how it works. So it looks like we did have a couple of questions come in for you. Okay. So if you don't have enough candidates for the election, but have a ballot question, do you still put the candidates on the ballot? Um, hold that question. It's answered in the next couple of slides. Perfect. But I'll give you the answer. The answer is yes. And then I'll tell you why. Okay. Awesome. I think a couple others might be answered later on too. Do you want me to just ask them now? So yes, we go can... ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Perfect. So can a candidate sign their own petition? Yes. All right. And then who or how is the two or four year term decided if not on the nominating petition or the ballot? Okay. That one I'm not going to answer now, but I am going to answer it before this this webinar ends. Perfect. Okay. Then I think that is all for now. Okay. Then we kind of let's move on to the next slide. Okay. So moving further, you cannot cancel an election if you do not have this ordinance. Bottom line. And you can't. So you know, if you're not sure if you have an ordinance, you better check your history, go back to your ordinances, figure it out. And if you don't think you have one, see if you could pass one quickly, okay? So the idea of having, requiring this notice of intent and this deadline is that if you don't have that, then anybody can decide at any time, including election day, that they want to be a write-in candidate. And let's say without the ordinance, you've got three people up, you've got three candidates. Well, you don't know if anybody's gonna to decide to be a write-in candidate. So even though the number of positions and the number of candidates matches, you still have to wait and see if somebody decides at the last minute that they want to be a write-in candidate and thus you have to hold the election. So having this ordinance can also be a time and money saver. And that's what this second bullet says, that without the ordinance, you've got to provide the opportunity for a citizen to decide even on election day that they want to be a write-in candidate. This third bullet answers the question that was asked about um, if there, you know, if you've got a mayor and you've got board members and you've only got one person, I, I'm not sure if this is how it was, you've only got one person running for mayor, but you've got more than that, do you take the mayor's name off? And the answer is no. No election can be canceled in part. And what that means is that if you've got one person who is a candidate for mayor, and only one person, and you've got three positions up, and you've got five candidates, not only do the people get to vote on the candidate on the council or the board candidates, they also get to vote on the mayor. Even though the mayor is likely to get more, you know, one vote, you, you, you're, you're never sure that. I did hear from a very small town clerk who told me that I think, I don't know when it was, two years ago when they held their election, no one voted. Seriously, no one voted, which I think is very sad. So even if there's only one candidate for mayor or there are two candidates or more for mayor, but there's only three candidates for trustee and that's all you're voting on, you still have to put everybody on the ballot. So it's all the people, all the positions, or none of them. You don't have the ability to take away one but not the other. So I hope that's clear. And then after the cancellation has been um, made by resolution and the people declared appointed, then you would post a notice note that the the, the election has been canceled and here who here's who got elected 
Okay. So um, now, if you have this ordinance, and this gets a little confusing. State law is is state law indicates that you need to put a blank line in each of the categories. So mayor, and then again for trustee, equal to the number of positions that are on the ballot and can be voted on. And the blank lines are for the write-in candidates. But if you have an ordinance that says they have to file to be write-in by the date and nobody does, then nobody would be a valid candidate and you can eliminate those lines. So with the ordinance, nobody decides to be a write-in candidate. You list the candidates who filed their petitions you're having the election, no need for the lines. But if somebody does file to be a write-in candidate, if one person files, it's one line. If two people file for the position, it's two lines and so forth, because you have to give the citizens an opportunity to write in the person's name. And let me explain that when you are a write-in candidate, your job is to go around and tell citizens to write your name in on the ballot. You don't indicate that there are write-in candidates in your legal notice because in your legal, legal notice, you're posting the ballot as it will appear before the voters. So if you have a write-in candidate, you're only going to have a blank line. If you don't have any write-in candidates, you don't have a blank line that you don't have, it's up to the person who is a writing candidate to take the initiative to let everybody know that he or she is running. Okay, question. Do you have a couple questions? Sure. So this first one is a two-parter. Right. Um, so the deadline for a write-in candidate falls on a Sunday. Is the deadline then the Friday before? Um, okay, let me, I, this, uh, I have to tell you that this computation of time, I, the answer is, I don't believe, I think the answer is no, but let me, let me look at computation of time, which is um, 31, uh, 31, 10, It says that, um, It says that if any act to be done um, is a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, the period is extended to include the next day. The only, um, and so that would include write-in candidate. The re, what would, where you would do the previous day, like the Friday, if it was a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, has to do with filing nomination petitions, with amending nomination petitions, or withdrawing nomination petitions. And being a write-in candidate is none. So therefore, the deadline would move to the um, would move would move to the Monday. However, we have to take a look at the language if it says prior to 64 days. It doesn't say that 64 days is the deadline, it says that 65 days is the deadline. So again, you have to take that into consideration. I have to tell you, it is extremely confusing. And I think people know that I have this long laundry list of things I would like to see changed in the municipal election code. And one of the things I want to see changed is to ensure that in a regular election, at the very least, none of the deadlines fall on weekends. So that it's a lot easier to figure out whether it's a Friday or a Monday. I hope I haven't confused the person. Awesome. Um, well, if so, we can do follow up. Yeah, we could right, we could do some more uh, talking about it, right. Perfect. Um, so second part of that question is this municipality has three seats open, but only two petitions taken out. If they only have two petitions returned, what happens to that third seat? 
All right, we'll talk about that. But remember, you've got, you got what, another 11 days? And people can pick up a petition on the very last day and still turn it in on the 24th. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't count that out right now. However, I will answer your questions as we move along further. Perfect. And then next question, how many petition packets can one resident sign if the town has five trustee seats up? Five. Unless, yeah, you can sign a person, statute says that a person can sign as many petitions as there are positions to be voted on. So for mayor, you can only sign one. But for board of trustees, how many ever positions are gonna be on the ballot is the number of petitions that can be signed. Unless you have something, your home rule, and you have something that says you can sign as many as you want. But for statutory towns, it's equal to the number of positions that can be voted on. Perfect, I think that's all the questions we have for this section. All right, so let's, let's move on. Okay, we've talked a little bit about writing candidates, so we'll, um, we'll I just kind of repeat what we talked about. So with an ordinance, a person can be a writing candidate by filing an affidavit of intent. Affidavit means it's got to be notarized prior to 64 days before the day of the election. So the deadline would be 60, the 65th day. Okay. And, and it does, again, it doesn't have to be a form. You know, I, I, I think we're kind of, we overly form, our, form ourselves or we want more forms than we need to. There's nothing wrong with forms, but absent a form, you know, good old letters are, you know, people still write letters and those are just particularly are fine. If you don't have this ordinance, and remember, the ordinance has to do two things. It's not enough for just to talk about being a write-in candidate. It also has to include a section that talks about canceling the election. Um, I remember in the past talking to a clerk where they had the first one, but they didn't say anything about the cancellation. So these two things have got to be linked. So if you don't have an ordinance, then you can't require an affidavit of intent, any name can be written in and you cannot cancel the election. So with an ordinance, if they're eligible writing candidates, those who filed the affidavit of intent, you list as many lines as there are positions to be voted on. In other words, well, and basically it, what, what you do is as many lines as there are people who want to serve as write-in candidates. But if there are no eligible write-in candidates and you have the ordinance and you can't cancel election, you don't have to have any blank lines. And if people just write in a name somewhere on the ballot, you just ignore it. And one of the reasons we we put this in statute is, and this is true, I mean, people people were writing in their own names. They were right, you know, they were writing in Mickey Mouse, they were writing in, you know, movie star names. It was, it was pretty amazing. And people in the before this ordinance, any name that was written in, regardless of whether it was a real person or not a real person, like Mickey Mouse, those names had to show up on the abstract of votes with the number of votes cast for those people, which of course was not just ridiculous, was sort of embarrassing. So we wanted to more professionalize how things look and that's why we did that. If you don't have an ordinance, again, as many lines as there are positions to be voted on. So I think I beat this <laughs> dead horse enough. Any further questions before we move on? We do have a couple. All right. Uh, do we need to pass this ordinance every election or is it one ordinance that covers all regular elections? I think it's just one ordinance that you would you adopt. And I think the language could include some statement that makes it clear it's for all elections. Perfect. Um, and then can a municipality pass an ordinance regarding write-in candidates at any time before the election? You, I'm not sure what 
that means. Um, if you mean having another deadline other than the prior to 64 days, I don't know why you would. Um, you know, the idea is, you know, in the in the old days when we were when we were um, circulating nomination petitions from the 50th to the 30th day before the day of the election, we still had these same provisions, but the cutoff was 20 days before the day of the election. Well, with UACAVA voters and with mail ballot elections, waiting until 20, to, 20 days before the day of the election to know whether you were going to have election or not was, you know, was ridiculous because you'd have to send out ballots, spend money getting them printed, spend money getting them mailed, only to cancel after the fact, which didn't make any sense. And I will tell you that I've talked to a number of clerks this time and also pre previously who have still code amendments that give that 20, 20 day deadline. And I think what's happened is that over years, they been able to cancel the election and then people just don't pay attention to what's going on down at the Capitol when it comes to changes to municipal election law. So if I did not answer your question, please restate it. Um, but again, I think when statutes are, are passed, they're vetted by the municipal league, some municipal clerks, um, staff down at the Capitol, and for the most part, they work. I think a lot of times people at the local level adopt ordinances that they think will work, they never use, and then when they have to, they find out they really didn't work. So I'm always one to say that unless you have a good reason for doing something other than what state statute says, follow state statute. But again, if I didn't answer the question, please let me know. Perfect. We have a couple more for you. All right. Um, so this one asks, my ordinance states affidavits can be filed five days prior to the election. Do I do 64 days or five days as the ordinance states? If you're a statutory town, I would fo follow state statute. My guess is your five days predates the 64 days. And since the state statute is newer, I would do that besides you need to follow as a statutory community, you have to follow state law. Awesome. Um, and then are the rules the same for home rule cities and statutory governed cities? Well, home rules can, as I like to say, can do what they damn well please. Um, but in this particular case, I don't see any reason to do anything other than what we've just been talking about. Perfect. For reasons that I gave you, you a Kava, mail voter, mail ballot, that kind of thing. Well, and it looks like we've got a follow up to that question really quick. All right. Um, so the further clarification, my municipality does not currently have an ordinance regarding write in candidates. Can the Board of Trustees still approve such an ordinance before the 64 days before the election? Yes. Perfect. Okay. And then I think we've got one more. All right. So on nomination petitions, is there a specific turnaround time for verifying the signature to the candidate? Um, no, but I, with 10 signatures, you know, required, I don't think there's any need to hold off. I think, you know, you could certainly do it in a relatively short period of time. And once you determine the sufficiency or insufficiency, I would contact the candidate because they're going to be waiting you know if they turn their petition in on a Monday and it's now it's Thursday or Friday and they haven't heard from you they're going to wonder so I would just say don't delay I think those are all the questions for now okay all right um there is a likelihood we could run a few minutes past one I hope that's not going to be a problem for people because um, now we get into some of the questions that were asked that we have to talk about the length of terms. All right, so here's what happens after you cancel the election. And here's what will happen. Sometimes what will happen, and the re sometimes the reason you will cancel the election is not that you have the same number of candidates as available positions, but you have fewer than the number of 
positions available. And then once you cancel the election, declare those people who did turn in petitions as elected, you realize that now what you have is you have a vacancy in office, okay? And now you have to fill the vacancy in office by the two methods that are available to, the, to you or to the governing body, appointment or special election. Well, if you couldn't get enough people to run in the regular election, what are your chances of getting people to run in a special election? Plus it's extra time, it's extra money. So plan A is always appointment, okay? Is always appointment and please be aware that you they need if they're going to go this route they should probably get these people appointed before the the, the election date would have a, have occurred in other words 64 days the election is april 5th 64 days before the day of the election is what early february sometime so between so that so between feb that whatever that date in february is i what is it the first i'm not sure and April 5th, it would behoove them to uh, get somebody appointed or, or some bodies appointed, depending on the number of vacancies, so that when after April 5th, when the new board is sworn in, you've got a full complement and you still don't have the vacancies remaining. Plus, if you wait more than 60 days, you're gonna have to have a special election. So anyway, here's how this works. Um, you've canceled the election. When the number of candidates running is the same as the number to be voted on, then every candidate is declared elected for a full term. When the number of candidates running for office is fewer than the available, that's when you have the vacancy. And that's when you have to deal with the vacancy. And we're gonna talk about how you deal with the vacancy. And please be aware on this note is really important. Even though the election has been canceled, the sitting board members have the opportunity and the right to complete their terms of office. So if you on February 3rd adopt a resolution canceling election, the current board members still stay in office until after the election date of April 5th. They don't start immediately because people get a chance to fill out their terms. Next slide. Okay, so a person who's appointed to fill a position because of a resignation must run at the next regular municipal election. Now, this is very important. When I talk to clerks, first of all, statutory towns, when they incorporate by law, the terms of office are for two years. However, there is a provision where they can change the length of term to four-year overlapping terms, which means in a normal situation, half run in one even-numbered year and the other half plus the mayor run in the next even-numbered year so that there is overlap in, in office. Now, you can have a mayor's term for two years and board member for four years. You can have mayor for four, board for four. You can have mayor for four, board for two, and you can have that. But what you cannot have, except when there is has been a vacancy since the last election, what you cannot have is both four and two year terms on the board. And sometimes when I talk to clerks and they tell me that, I know that that was the case at one point when they had vacancies that were filled and then there was turnover or something else going on and people just assume that's how it was going to be from here on out. So when I get told that there are you know, three positions or four positions that are four years and two are for two years, I go, mm, no, you got a problem here. And the problem is that while you dealt with the vacancy, it got carried on 
as gospel for future elections. So let's talk about this. This is one of the hardest things I think for clerks to understand. It is sometimes for me as well, but here's how it goes. You've got three four-year terms on the ballot. You've got two candidates. You have one vacancy. If there had been a candidate, the person would have would serve for four years, but because there is a vacancy and you're going to appoint somebody, the person who is appointed must run at the next election, even though that is not when that position would actually be on the ballot. So that would mean that two years from now, you had four people, four positions on the ballot, the three whose term would normally be on the ballot, whose positions would normally be on the ballot, plus the shortened one. So now you have four. The way you determine who gets the full and who gets the shortened term is by the number of votes that they receive. And I want you to write down this statute number, 31-10, dash 1205, 1205, parentheses 1.5, because that's in statute where you find the requirement to do it in the way I just described. 31-10, dash 1205, 1.5. And the only reason <laughs> that I know it by heart is because I've been talking to several clerks about it over the last few days. So the sub bullets, if the election is the, if the, if there is the one where the position would normally vote it on, then whoever gets elected gets a four year term. If it's not, it's for a two year term. And a person who is currently on the board with a four year term running for reelection may or may not get another four year term if there is a shortened position on the ballot, it all depends on how many people vote for him. So it's no guarantee. So the last bullet, the third, the second big bullet I've just talked about. So the last one is when people pick up nomination petitions and you have a situation which was just described where you have five positions on the ballot, three would be for the full year term and two would be for the shortened term. You don't have a petition that says, um, I, Karen Goldman, am running for the position of board of trustee for a two year term or for a four year term. I'm just running for a position on the board. And depending upon who votes for me will determine Number one, first of all, if I get elected, and number two, whether I get elected for a four-year term or a two-year term. And if you can remember this, so basically, if somebody resigns, well, we talked about resignations before. So if there is a, so if you, if you look at your last election and you saw that you had four-year terms and two-year terms or full terms and shortened terms, it was because somebody resigned from their position after the last election or the election was held and there was a vacancy and the person was appointed and has to run again. Now I'm gonna pause and give you a chance to wrap your head around this. If you think about it and you read the statutes and you read what we've written here and you think about it, it really does make sense. But let me entertain any questions that we may have about this. We do have a couple. Okay. Um, so the first says, if I understand correctly, one of my council members will be, oops, sorry, lost my question really quick. Um, all right, if I understand correctly, one of my council members will be running for mayor, leaving his remaining two years vacant. The person appointed to fill that vacant position must run for election at the next regular election. 
Yes. Well, yes. So, so, so what happens? So you've got a board member who's got two years left on the term. And if and only if that person wins mayor, it, so the so the, so the position of the person running for mayor is not on the ballot this year because it's only becomes vacant if the person becomes mayor. If the person loses, then he or she can still serve the remaining two years of the term. And that's come up a couple of times. But let's say a person with two years remaining in office gets elected mayor. Now there is a vacancy in the once the once the person is sworn in and resigns from the position of trustee there is a vacancy that person appointed would run in the net would serve for two years and since the next election would be one for where the petition position would normally be on the ballot that position would then become a four-year term Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then we've got someone who would like a little bit more clarification on the terms. Um, they said, I think Karen is saying that you can have a board comprised of three two year terms and three four year terms. Is that correct? No. No, the only way, no, it's either or. You either have all board members serve two-year terms or all board members serve four-year terms. That is normal. What happens is that you can have an election where you have all six positions on the ballot. Three of them would normally be on the ballot the other three are on the ballot because people fill, people resigned or election was canceled or something like that. People were appointed and now they have to run in the next election and those positions would not normally be up. The best thing to do, and I know it's difficult because some of the records are not the best, is to go back to your prior elections and see what happened. And you may have to go back two or three election cycles to figure out, you know, when the position would normally be on the ballot. Did anybody resign? Did anybody get appointed? And please, for the future, make sure those records are clear and accurate. So the answer is no, you can only have full and shortened terms if you're trying to fill, if you have filled um, a vacancy and it's and this is your next election. So the vacancy occurred somewhere between April of 2020 and now. Hopefully that is clear. Awesome. Um, and then we've got one more for you. Okay. Um, what happens if you cancel an election because you have the exact amount of people running as open and you are filling two-year terms because of previous resignations and they are appointed or to make the alternating terms? Okay, so that statute I gave you is pretty clear that when you have differing terms on the ballot, you cannot cancel the election, even if you just have the same or fewer number of people. However, there, there might be a way to do that. But remember, if you've got a mayoral race, but there's only, but there's still only, but you're dealing with, with board of trustees and there's, you know, only the same number, whatever, if you've still got a mayor race, you don't cancel anything and everybody gets to vote, even though there's only three people running for three positions or four people running for four positions, if there's a mayor's race, you gotta let people vote on everything. So one of the things I'd like to suggest, and this requires approval by your attorney, and please don't tell me you don't like your attorney or you don't think your attorney um, isn't doing his job, too bad, so sad. You've got to involve your attorney, number one. And number two, 
you need to get acquiescence from the candidates that instead of holding the election, they would be willing to have a drawing that will determine who gets the four years and who gets the two years. I would not, pro I, I only propose it and I only would say you need to go through it if your attorney is okay with it, number one, and if all of the candidates are in agreement, in which case, you know, if you had like five positions, three were for four years and two were for two, you'd have five pieces of paper, three would have the number four written on it and the other would have two. Otherwise, according to that statute I gave you, you've got to hold an election. And I think, and I have no municipalities where they where they've actually done that. It's not in statute. Whether it's totally legal, I can't say. I'm not an attorney. To me, it makes sense if everybody agrees. Awesome. Um, we do have a couple more questions, but I think we're going to keep going just to make sure we are, you know, respectful of people's times, and we will follow up on these after the webinar, if that's all right, Karen. Okay, that's fine. So I believe, is that my last slide? Um, yeah, all right. This is the, this and this is that statute that I, uh, this is what I just talked about. So I think that's it. And I think, McKenna, you've got a couple things you want to say now? I do. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that everyone knew how to get the credit that they needed um, after this webinar. So each webinar is worth one half credit. Um, that form is going to be available at cml.org where the video and the slides will be available as well. I will also send a link to all of that information after the webinar. You'll complete and submit that form to Kathy Novak at CMCA. Um, so she'll be able to help out with all of that. And then our next election webinars are going to take place on March 10th and April 21st. So make sure you register for those. Um, Karen will be here again to give us more insight. I know she's very, very helpful and a great resource. And we really appreciate all that she does for the clerks and all the municipalities in Colorado. So thank you. Um, do you want to answer a couple more questions or do we want to? Um, how many more do we have? So we've got two or three. Um, I get, you know, I I can probably do it in a short period of time, and I think it'd probably be easier while everybody's still here. Um, I don't know if we've lost some people, but if everybody's still here, and then I, we can also put it in writing as well. And then let me just say too that if anything comes up um, afterwards, you know, you you know how to email me directly, and if it the questions relate to um, what we talked about today, then I think if it works okay with you, McKenna, I will also send you the answer and then maybe you can post them somehow for everybody else to see. Absolutely, yeah, okay. I can definitely why do don't, that. Why don't we deal with the last questions here? No more, and then if there are any after that, we'll, we'll, we'll do it as I said, but awesome. while we have people, let's, we, might, we might as well. Perfect, sure. So the first question asks, are, Pro tem is currently running for mayor as our mayor resigned. Is the pro tem's vacant seat still her seat if she loses the mayor's seat, or does her trustee seat count as an open seat on the ballot? If, if, if no, I mean, she still keeps her seat. There is nothing in statute that requires somebody to resign from unless there's something in a home rule ordinance, and I do know there is one, but unless somebody is, um, um, you know, is the only person the time the seat, the current seat would become vacant is if the person running for a different office gets elected. So if she doesn't get elected, she's still on the board. Awesome. And then question two asks, if a petitioner needs to, or yeah, so if a petitioner needs two more signatures, they take a blank petition to get the two additional signatures they don't need to get the full amount needed, correct? No, they, they, only, they only need slightly more than what is needed to bring it up to 10. And you know, if they, if, if they get eight, I wouldn't just get two. I encourage them to get more than two because if they get two and one of them isn't valid, then they gotta do it again. 
and again until the deadline passes. But no, no, because the eight that were considered valid remain valid. Perfect. Then I think those are all the questions for now. Um, okay. We'll follow up on any others that come up um, and we'll make sure to get all that information to you guys probably tomorrow. So expect a follow up email from me. Um, Karen, do you have any closing thoughts before we jump off? I don't, I don't think so. I, I would encourage you to go back and re when the slides get posted and, you know, if I know this is confusing to people, um, reread them, reread the slides, go back to statute. Um, a lot of it is in statute and you can always reach me and um, I'm happy to help out whenever I, wherever I can. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Karen. We really appreciate all of your time. This is always a very, very helpful resource and very glad to get to learn from you. So thank you. You're welcome and good luck, everybody. And um, um, you're on your way and I know you can do it. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah.